5. The unification of TFIE world and the change in historical perspective familiarity is the opiate of the imagination, and, just because every Western schoolboy knows that the oceanic voyages of discovery made by West European mariners some four and a half centuries ago were an epoch-making historical event, adult Western minds are apt to take the consequences for granted. In addressing myself to a Western public I shall therefore make no apology for pointing out how dramatic and how revolutionary the effect of our ocean-faring ancestors' exploit has been. It has produced nothing less than a complete transformation of the map of the world not, of course, the physical map, but the human layout of that portion of the surface of our planet that is traversable and habitable by mankind and that the Greeks used to call the Alxophsphor. This Western-made change in man's human environment will be my first topic, but it leads on to two others. External changes of this magnitude usually evoke corresponding readjustments in people's attitudes, and, sure enough, when we look around us, we can see that. Among the great majority of mankind, the effects of those Western voyages of discovery recent though they are on even the shortest-sighted historical timescale have in fact already brought about a drastic change in historical outlook. This will be my second topic, but it will bring up a third by laying bare a paradox. The majority of mankind that I here have in mind is, of course, the non-Western part, and the paradox is that today we Westerners are the only people in the world whose outlook on history still remains pre -degamon. Personally, I do not believe that this antediluvian Western traditional historical outlook is going to last much longer. I have no doubt that a reorientation is in store for us in our turn and in our case, I fancy, it will be one in the literal meaning of the word. But why should we wait for history, like some 18th century Prussian drill sergeant, to take us by the scruff of the neck and twist our heads straight for us? Though our neighbors have recently been re-educated in this unpleasant and humiliating way, we ought surely to do better, for we cannot plead that we have been taken by Sir Price, as they were. The facts stare us in the face, and... By exercising our historical imagination, we can perhaps anticipate the compulsory education that is already on its way to us. The Greek Stoic philosopher Cleanthes praised Zeus and fate for grace to follow their lead of his own will without flinching, for if, he adds, I quail and rebel, I shall have to follow just the same. Let us now plunge into our subject by reminding ourselves of the revolutionary change in the map. One knows that mankind, being human, is always and everywhere in danger of exaggerating the historical importance of contemporary events because of their personal importance to the particular generation that happens to be overtaken by them. All the same, I will hazard the guess that, when the age in which we ourselves are living has been left sufficiently far behind to be seen by future historians in a revealingly remote perspective, the particular contemporary event with which we are now concerned will stand out like a mountain peak on the horizon of the Past carrot by the age in which we are living I mean the last five or six thousand years within which mankind, after having been human for at least six hundred thousand years before that, attained the modest level of social and moral achievement that we call civilization. Carrot. Call the recent change in the map contemporary because the four or five centuries during which it has been taking place are a twinkling of an eye on the timescale that our geologists and astronomers have now revealed to us. And, when I am trying to picture to myself the perspective in which the events of these last few thousand years will appear to future historians, I am thinking of historians living 20,000 or 100,000 years later than the present date taking it on faith from our modern Western scientists that there has been life on this planet for about 800 million years already, and that the planet will continue to be habitable for at least as long again, unless Western man's Precocious technological know-how cuts the story short. If the claim that I am making for the historic importance of our subject seems a large one, let us recall how extraordinary an event this change in the map has been. It has, I suggest, two aspects, of which the second is the more sensational. In the first place, since about AD 1500, to reckon in terms of our Western parochial era, mankind has been gathered into a single worldwide society. From the dawn of history to about that date, the earthly home of man had been divided into many isolated mansions. Since about AD 1500, the human race has been brought under one roof. 
This has been accomplished, under God, by human action, and here we come to the really sensational point. The agent of this revolutionary change in the affairs of men might have been any one of the diverse parochial societies that were on the map when the revolution was put in hand, but the particular parochial society that has actually done the deed is the one that, of all of them, was the most unlikely candidate. In an effort to jump clear of my native western standing ground and to look at this question from a less eccentric point of view, I have asked myself who was the most centrally placed and most intelligent observer that I could think of among notable non-westerners who were alive. At the moment when a few ships companies of western mariners embarked on the enterprise of unifying the world, and I have found my man in the Emperor Babur. Babur was a descendant, in the fifth generation, of Tamerlane the Transoxanian conqueror who made the last attempt to unify the world by land operations from a continental center. Within Babur's lifetime AD 1483-1530 Columbus reached America by sea from Spain and da Gama India from Portugal. Babur started his career as Prince of Fargana in the upper valley of the Jaxarts, a small country which had been the center of the Alxo Arivti since the 2nd century BC. Babur invaded India overland 21 years after da Gama had arrived there by sea. Last but not least, Babur was a man of letters whose brilliant autobiography in his Turkish mother tongue reveals a spirit of outstanding intelligence and perceptiveness. What was Babur's horizon? To the east of Fargana it included both India and China, and to the west it extended to Babur's own distant kinsmen, the Ottoman Turks. Babur took lessons from the Osmanlis in military technique, and he admired them for their piety and prowess in extending the bounds of Islam, Hai refers to them as the Ghazis of Rum, the happy warriors who had succeeded, where the primitive Muslim Arabs had signally failed, in conquering for Islam the homeland of Eastern Orthodox. Christendom I could not recollect any mention of Western Christendom in Babur's memoirs, and I have found none in the exhaustive geographical index of Mrs. Beveridge's magnificent English translation. Of course Babur was aware of the existence of the Franks, for he was a cultivated man and he knew his Islamic history. If he had had occasion to allude to them, he would probably have described them as ferocious but frustrated infidels living in a remote corner of the world at the extreme western tip of one of the many peninsulas of the continent of Asia. About 400 years before his time, he would have gone on to relate, these barbarians had made a demonic attempt to break out of their cramped and uninviting corner into the broader and richer domains of Rum and Dar al-Islam. It had been a critical moment for the destinies of civilization, but the uncouth aggressors had been foiled by the genius of Saladin, and their military reverses had been capped by a crushing moral defeat when the Christians of Rum, faced with a choice between two alternative future masters, chose the side of the angels by opting for the prophets. Turban in preference to the Pope's tiara, and accepted the boon of an Ottoman peace. The arrival of Franca-ish ships in India in AN 1498, 21 years before Babur's own first descent upon India in AD 1519, seems to have escaped Babur's attention unless his silence is to be explained not by ignorance of the event but by a feeling that the wanderings of these water gypsies were unworthy of a historian's notice. So this allegedly intelligent Transoxanian man of letters and man of action was blind to the portent of the Portuguese circumnavigation of Africa? He failed to perceive that these ocean-faring Franks had turned the flank of Islam and taken her in the rear? Yes, I believe Babur would have been utterly astonished if he had been told that the empire which he was founding in India was soon to pass from his descendants to Franca-ish successors. He had no inkling of the change that was to come over the face of the world between his generation and ours. But this, I submit, is not a reflection on Babur's intelligence, it is one more indication of the quimes of the major event in the history of the world in our time. Since AD 1500 the map of the Alksof Karat EVR has indeed been transformed out of all recognition. Down to that date it was composed of a belt of civilizations girdling the Old World from the Japanese Isles on the northeast to the British Isles on the northwest, Japan, China, Indochina, Indonesia, India, Dar al-Islam, the Orthodox Christendom of Rum, and another Christendom in the west. Though this belt sagged down, in the middle, 
from the north temperate zone to the equator and thus ran through a fairly wide range of climates and physical environments, the social structure and cultural character of these societies was singularly uniform it each of them consisted of a mass of peasants, living and working under much the same conditions as their forefathers on the morrow of the invention of agriculture some six to eight thousand years back and a small minority of rulers enjoying a monopoly of power, surplus wealth, leisure, knowledge, and skill which in turn enhanced their power. There had been one or two earlier generations of civilizations of the same type in the old world. In AD 1500 some of these were still remembered, while others, since brought to light by modem Western archaeologists, had been forgotten. There were two of the same type in existence at this date in the New World unknown to those of the old world and barely known even to each other. The living civilizations of the old world were in touch with each other, though not so closely as to be, or feel themselves to be, members of a single society. Their contact, such as it was, down to AD I-500, had been established and maintained along two different lines of communication. There was a maritime line which will be familiar to latter-day Westerners as the Peninsular and Oriental Steamship Company's route to Kobe from Seven Ilberry. In AD 1500, and indeed as recently as the time of a great-uncle of mine, a vivid memory of my childhood, who commanded one of the Honorable East India Company's passenger sailing ships and retired from the sea before the cutting of the Suez Canal without ever having served on board a steamer, this waterway through a chain of inland seas was broken by a portage between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, with an alternative portage between the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. In the Mediterranean and Japanese sections of this maritime route, traffic had frequently been lively, and, from about 120 b.c. onwards, an infectious wave of maritime enterprise, set in motion by Greek mariners from Alexandria who found their way to Ceylon had travelled on eastwards through Indonesia till it had carried Polynesian canoes to Easter Island. Yet, adventurous and romantic as these pre-Western seafarers were, the water route that they opened up never came to be of more than secondary importance as a line of communication between the civilizations. The main line was provided by the chain of steppes and deserts that cut across the belt of civilizations from the Sahara to Mongolia. For human purposes, the steppe was an inland sea which, in virtue of happening to be dry, was of higher conductivity for human intercourse than the salt water sea ever was before the close of the 15th century of the Chris. Tien era. This waterless sea had its dry shot ships and its keyless ports. The steppe galleons were camels, the steppe galleys horses, and the steppe ports caravan cities ports of call on oasis islands and termini on the coasts where the sand waves of the desert broke upon the sun. Petra and Palmyra, Damascus and Or, Tamerlane's Samarkand, and the Chinese Emporia at the gates of the Great Wall. Steppe traversing horses, not ocean traversing sailing ships, were the sovereign means of locomotion by which the separate civilizations of the world as it was before AD. 1500 were linked together to the slight extent to which they did maintain contact with each other. In that world, as you see, Babur's Fargana was the central point and the Turks were, in Babur's day, the central family of nations. C.A. Turcocentric History of the World has been published in our lifetime by the latest in the series of the great Ottoman Turkish Westimizers, President Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. It was a brilliant device for restoring the morale of his fellow countrymen, but it was a still more brilliant feat of genuine historical intuition, for from the 4th century of the Christian era, when they pushed the last of their Indo-European-speaking predecessors off the steppe, down to the 17th century, which witnessed the collapse of the Ottoman, the Safai, and the Timurid Turkish dynasties in their respective domains of Rum, Iran, and India, the Turkish-speaking P.E.O. Please really were the keystone of the Asiatic arch from which the pre dagaman belt of civilizations hung S.U.S. Pended. During those 1200 years, the overland link between the separate civilizations was commanded by Turkish steppe power, and, from their central position in this pre dagaman world, the Turks rode out, conquering and to conquer, east and west and south and north, to Manchuria and Algeria, to the Ukraine and the Deccan. But now we come to the Great Revolution, a technological revolution by which the West made its fortune. 
got the better of all the other living civilizations, and forcibly united them into a single society of literally worldwide range. The revolutionary Western invention was the substitution of the ocean for the steppe as the principal medium of world communication. This use of the ocean, first by sailing ships and then by steamships, enabled the West to unify the whole inhabited and habitable world, including the Americas. Babur's Fargana had been the central point of a world united by horse traffic over the steppe, but in Babur's lifetime the center of the world made a sudden big jump. From the heart of the continent it jumped to its extreme western verge, and, after hovering round Seville and Lisbon, it settled for a time in Elizabeth's England. In our own lifetime W.C. have seen this volatile world center flit again from London to New York, but this shift to a still more eccentric position on the far side of the herring pond is a local movement, not comparable in magnitude to the jump, in Bobber's day, from the steppe ports of Central Asia to the ocean ports of the Atlantic. That huge jump was caused by a sudden revolution in the means of locomotion. The steppe ports were put out of action when the ocean-going sailing ship superseded the camel and the horse, and now that, under our eyes, the ocean-going steamship is being superseded by the aeroplane. We may ask ourselves whether the center of the world is not likely to jump again and this time as sensationally as in the 16th century under the impetus of a technological revolution that is at least as radical as the 16th century substitution of da Gama's caravel for Babur's Tipichuk. I will recur to this possibility before I conclude. Meanwhile, before we roll up Bobber's overland map of the world and unfurl the maritime map that has held the field from Bobber's day to ours, let us call the role of the separate civilizations among which the human race was partitioned down to Bobber's day and interrogate them. Briefly about their historical outlook. The uniformity which these separate civilizations display in their cultural character and their social structure extends to their historical outlook as well. Every one of them was convinced that it was the only civilized society in the world, and that the rest of mankind were barbarians, untouchables, or infidels. In holding this view, it is evident that at least five out of the six pre civilizations must have been in error, and the sequel has shown that actually not one of them was right. All variants of a fallacy are no doubt equally untrue, but they may not all be equally preposterous and it is instructive to run through these half-dozen rival and mutually incompatible versions of a common chosen people myth in an ascending order of their defiance of common sense. For the Chinese, their compartment of the surface of the earth was all that is under heaven, and the territory under the imperial government's immediate rule was the Middle Kingdom. This point of view is expressed with a serene assurance in the celebrated reply of the great emperor Ch. Yen Lung, Imperabat A.D. 1735 to 95 to a letter from King George III of Great Britain proposing that the two potentates should enter into diplomatic and commercial relations with each other as to your entreaty to send one of your nationals to be accredited to my celestial court and to be in control of your country's trade with China this request is contrary to all usage of my dynasty and cannot possibly be entertained our ceremonies and code of laws differ so completely from your own that, even if your envoy were able to acquire the rudiments of our civilization, you could not possibly transplant our manners and customs to your alien soil. Swaying the wide world, I have but one aim in view, namely to maintain a perfect governance and to fulfill the duties of the state. I set no value on objects strange or ingenious, and have no use for your country's manufactures. One if the barbarian envoy Lord McCartney had divulged the awkward fact that his royal master periodically went out of his mind, the emperor would not have been surprised. A no sane barbarian prince Ealing would have had the audacity to address the son of heaven as though he were his equal, and the tone, taken in all innocence, by the draftsman of the British missive was indeed bound to appear outrageous in the light of history as known to C.H. Ian Lung and his entourage. Asterisk Ch. Yen Lung himself had made history by subjugating the last wild nomads of the Eurasian steppe and thereby bringing to an end a duel between the desert and the sown that had been one of the main threads in the weft of human history for the past 3,000 years. The Son of Heaven had achieved this historic feat virtually won for the full text C. White, Sir F., China and Foreign Powers, Oxford University Press, London, 1927, Appendix. Single-handed.
the only other party that could claim any share in the honors was the Caesar at Moscow, the South Sea Barbarians, as the Chinese called the Western Water Gypsies who had been washed up against the south coast of China from that direction, had had no hand at all in this great victory for the cause of sedentary civilization. But the personal achievements of the statesman and warrior Ch. Ian Lung could add little to the effulgence radiating from the Son of Heaven ex officio. The empire over which he ruled was the oldest, most successful, and most beneficent of all living political institutions. Its foundation in the 3rd century BC had given a civilized world a civilized government conducted by a competitively recruited and highly cultivated civil service, in place of an international anarchy in which a number of parochial states, dominated by a hereditary feudal nobility, had plagued mankind by waging perpetual wars with one another. During the twenty intervening centuries, this carefully ordered world peace had occasionally lapsed, but such lapses had always been temporary, and, at the close of Ch. Ian Lung's reign, the latest restoration of the Middle Kingdom was in its heyday. This political casket had preserved an intellectual treasure, the findings of schools of philosophy which had explored all the alternative answers to the fundamental questions of metaphysics and ethics. And the children of the Middle Kingdom had shown that their inborn intelligence and statesmanship were matched by their broad-mindedness when they had adopted a great alien religion the Indian-born Mahayana to meet any spiritual needs that their secular civilization might not be able to meet entirely out of its own resources. On the strength of this historical background, was Ch. Ian Lung right in answering George III as he did? Doubtless. Some of my Western readers smiled as they read his answer. They smiled of course, because they knew the sequel, but what does the sequel prove? It proves, no doubt, that the Emperor Ch. Ian Lung and his advisors were unaware of the overwhelming physical power which the South Sea Barbarians had acquired from their practical applica. Shins of New Discoveries in Physical Science At the date of Lord McCartney's mission there were Chinese MCNOflopters, already in the flower of their age and holding responsible positions in the Imperial Service who were to live to see Great Britain make war on China and dictate terms of peace to her at the cannon's mouth. But docs not this very sequel also prove that Ch. Ian Lung was as wise in his policy of non-intercourse as he was out of date in his information about the South Sea Barbarians' military caliber. His intuition had warned him against trafficking in strange or ingenious British wares, and one very strange ware that British merchants offered to the imperial government's subjects was opium. When the imperial authorities banned the traffic, as a respectable government was bound to do, the barbarians took advantage of their unsuspected military superiority to blast an entry by naval gunfire for British trade in China on British terms. I know this is a simplification of the story of the Opium War, but in essence it is the truth, and the best that can be said for the perpetrators of this international crime is that they have, ever after, been ashamed of it. I well remember this. I hope, redeeming sense of shame being communicated to me as a child by my mother when I asked her about the Opium War and she told me the facts. To the siren voice of history, which lured the Son of Heaven at peeking into fancying himself to be the unique two for a summary of the facts, see note at the end of this essay. Representative of Civilization with a capital C, was playing the same trick, in AD 1500, on his counterpart the Caesar at Moscow. He too was the ruler of the latest avatar of a world empire that had occasionally lapsed but, so far, had never failed to recover itself. The universal peace radiated by Augustus from a first Rome on the banks of the Tiber had been re-established by Constantine round a second Rome on the shores of the Bosphorus, and, when the Constantinopolitan Empire, after dying and rising again three times over in the 7th, the 11th, and the 13th centuries of the Christian era had fallen. To the infidel Turks in AD 1453, the scepter had passed to a third Rome at Moscow whose kingdom was to have no end, so all pious Muscovites must believe. The Muscovite heir of Roman world power had inherited, by the same token, the cultural achievements of Rome's Greek predecessors, and, as if that was not enough, he was also God's chosen defender of the great alien religious faith Christianity which had been adopted by the pagan Greco-Roman world to make good its own spiritual shortcom. Ings, the heir of Greece, Rome, and Christ, and, through Christ, 
of God's chosen people Israel. The title of Muscovy appeared, in Muscovite eyes, to be as conclusive as it was unique, h if the Tsar's pretension had come to the Son of Heaven's notice, he would perhaps have treated it with a certain leniency. When, 1500 years or so before the Dagaman revolution in the map of the world, the first empire of Tizen had made an adventurous voyage of exploration into the waterless sea of the steppe and had just brushed against the first empire of Rome with the tips of its antennae, the Chinese desert mariners had generously labeled this surprising discovery Ta Tizen, the Great China in the Far West. But Tizen and Ta Tizen had always been insulated from one another by intervening neighbors who challenged the claims of both. In Hindu eyes, for instance, the Buddhism that China had so reverently adopted from India was nothing better than a deplorable aberration, happily abandoned at home, from Hindu orthodoxy. It was the Brahmans who held a monopoly of right ritual, inspired scriptures, and correct theology. Much of the population even of India, and every man, woman, and child in the world beyond the bounds of the Aryan Holy Land, were untouchable outcasts. India's Muslim conquerors might wield irresistible material power, but they could not cleanse themselves from their ritual leprosy. The Muslims, for their part, were as hard on the Hindus and Christians as the Hindus were on the Muslims and Chinese. As the Muslims saw it, the prophets of Israel were all right and Jesus was God's last and greatest prophet before his final messenger Muhammad. The Muslims' quarrel was not with the prophet Jesus but with the Christian Church, which had captivated Rum by capitulating to pagan Greek polytheism and idolatry. From this shameful betrayal of the revelation of the one true God, Islam had retrieved the pure religion of Abraham. Between the Christian polytheists on the one side and the Hindu polytheists on the other there again shone the light of monotheism and in Islam's survival lay the hope of the world. This traditional Islamic scale of values comes out sharply in the closing sentence of the great Egyptian historian Al-Gabardi's narrative of the events of the year of the Hijra 1213. So this year reached its close. Among the unprecedented events that occurred in it, the most portentous was the cessation of the pilgrimage from Egypt to the holy cities of the Hijaz. They did not send the holy draperies, Kisiva, for the Kaaba and they did not send the purse, Sarah. The like of this had never happened in the present age, and never during the rule of the Banu Osman. Truly the ordering of events lies with God alone. 3. Which was this exciting year? In our Western notation, the 12 months corresponding to AH 1213 run from June AD. 1798 to June 1799. It was, you see, the year in which Napoleon descended upon Egypt, and the sentence that I have quoted is Al-Gabardi's grand finale to a most vivid and penetrating account of this supremely dramatic war of the worlds. Being a Martian myself, I was pulled up short, as I well remember, the first time I read those concluding words. Yet one cannot read Al-Gabardi without taking him seriously. He would undoubtedly figure on a list of candidates for the distinction of ranking as leading historians of civilized society up to date, Jay shall revert to this passage and try to persuade my fellow Westerners that our Philistine inclination to laugh at it ought to move us to laugh, instead, at our own unconscionable parochial mindedness. For now we come to the two really laughably fantastic cases of a local civilization's fancying itself to be the only civilization in the world. The Japanese actually believed that their country was three Sheikh Adbar Rahman al Gabardi, Ia Ibialat Rflt Tarab Mvoa Alabar, Cairo, AH 1322, 4 volumes, volume 111, p 63, French translation, Cairo, Mbmiri Nationale, and Paris, La Rue, AD. 1888 to 96, 9 volumes, volume 6. P. 121. The land of the gods and in consequence inviolable to invaders, though the Japanese themselves had in recent times successfully invaded it to the cost of their unlucky Nordic predecessors the Hari Ainu. Japan the Middle Kingdom. Why, Japan in AD 1500 was still a feudal society in the undefeating state of anarchy from which China had been salvaged by Tizen Shiwangti in 22 RBC. What China? so long ago, had achieved for herself unaided, 
Japan had failed to accomplish after having enjoyed for nearly a thousand years the blessings of a borrowed Chinese secular civilization and an Indian higher religion passed on to her by Chinese good offices. Could folly fly farther? Why, yes, it would seem that it could, for the Western variant of the universal fallacy surely out fold the Japanese. The Franks were solemnly asserting in AD. 1500 that the true heir of Israel, Greece, and Rome was not the Orthodox Eastern Christendom but theirs, and that it was not the Western but the Orthodox Church that was schismatic. To listen to the Franca-ish theologians you might have imagined that it was the four Eastern Patriarchates, and not the Patriarchate of Rome, that had doctored the creed by slipping a filioque into it. And, to listen to the Roman emperors of the German nation in their political controversies with the Greek and Russian successors of Augustus and Constantine, you might have imagined that it was the Greek and Oriental provinces and not the Latin provinces in which the Roman imperial government had perished, never to revive, in the 5th century after Christ. In AD 1500 the audacity of these Franca-ish pretensions to be the chosen people was enough to take away the breath of any rightly informed and properly impartial arbitrator. But a more astonishing fact remains to be recorded. Since then, four centuries and a half and what centuries? Have. Rolled by and the Franks are still singing the same old song today, singing it solo now, too for the other voices in the chorus of civilizations that were chanting a fallacious creed in unison in A.D. 1500 have, one by one, changed their tune between that year and this. The success of the non-Western majority of mankind in re-educating themselves, while Western minds have been sticking in archaic mud, is not, of course, in itself a proof of innately superior acumen or virtue. The beginning of wisdom is a salutary shock and the non-Western societies have had a tremendous shake-up administered to them by the Western civilization's boisterous impact. The West alone has so far escaped this unceremonious treatment. Un, shattered, up till now, by an upheaval of its own making, our local civilization is still hugging the smug and slovenly illusion in which its opposite numbers indulged till they took their educative toss from the leveled horns of an un. Intentionally altruistic Western bull. Sooner or later, the repercussions of this collision will assuredly recoil upon the West herself, but for the present this Janus-like figure slumbers on a broad a charging bull, at home a now solitary sleeping beauty. The shocks which the other civilizations have received have indeed been severe enough to wake even the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Imagine the psychological effect of the British diktat of A.D. 1842 on some Chinese scholar-statesman who was old enough to remember the Emperor C. H. E. Lung's handling of Lord McCartney's embassy 49 years earlier. Read Al Gabardi. I have only space to quote his account of one incident that followed the sudden appearance, on Friday the 8th Muharram, a h. 1213, of 25 foreign ships off the Egyptian port of Alexandria. The townspeople were wondering what the foreigners could have come for, when a little boat stood in and landed ten persons. These foreigners said that they were Englishmen, and they added that they were on the lookout for some Frenchmen, who had started with a considerable fleet for an unknown destination. They were afraid, they said, of seeing these Frenchmen make a surprise attack on Egypt, because they knew that the people of Egypt would not be able to repel the invaders or to prevent them from landing. The foreigners went on to say, we shall be content to keep the sea with our ships, in order to defend the city and patrol the coast, we shall ask you for nothing but water and provisions, and for these we will undertake to pay. The notables of the city refused, however, to enter into relations with the English, and said to them, this country belongs to the Sultan, and neither the French nor any other foreigners have any business here, so be good enough to leave us. At these words the F. English messengers returned to their ships and went off to look for their provisions somewhere else instead of at Alexandria, in order that God might accomplish the work that was preordained in his decree. For when one reads on, one finds that these latter-day Gusta Dei per Francos stimulated the receptive doctor of the University of Al-Azhar to begin his own personal re-education immediately. One of the first acts of the French after occupying Cairo was to stage there a scientific exhibition, with practical demonstrations, and our historian was among the visitors. 
After remarking that the French evidently mistook the Muslims for children who could be impressed by monkey tricks, and that this was really rather childish of the French themselves, Al Gabardi frankly re asterisk French translation, volume 6, at IMT. Courts his admiration for the demonstrated achievements of Francaish science. 5. He notices that, among the damage suffered by the French in a revolt which they had provoked by their high handed behavior at the outset, the loss which they appeared to mind the most was that of some scientific instruments that had been destroyed in the house of the savant Caffarelli. 6. But Al Gabardi's interest in French science is surpassed by his sensitiveness to French justice. French soldiers are convicted of housebreaking with violence, and, on Napoleon's personal orders, they pay for their crime with their lives. 7. Napoleon's successor in command of the French Army of Occupation, General Kleber, is assassinated by a Muslim fanatic, and the murderer is given a genuine fair trial. This trial wins Al Gabardi's enthusiastic admiration, and, frank as always, he records his opinion that the Muslims would not, in corresponding circumstances, have risen to that moral level. He is so intensely interested in the proceedings and so eager to preserve a record of them, that he incorporates the dossier of the trial in his narrative, reproducing the documents verbatim in the French military chancery's defective Arabic. 8. When one observes how quickly and readily the Egyptian Muslim scholar Al Gabardi learned a French lesson that was very far from being without tears, one's mind turns to the series of great Ottoman Turkish westernizing statesmen, Mermd Ali of Kavala, the Macedonian battalion commander who came and saw what the French had been doing in Egypt and who carried on Napoleon's Revo 5 French translation, volume 6, p. 75, cp. pages 70-71. 6 Ibid p. 66. 7 Ibid. Pages 82-3. 8 Ibid pages 223-251. Lushionary work there after Napoleon had come and gone, and Sultan Selim III, who lost his life at Constantinople, nine years before Napoleon's disembarkation at Alexandria, in a pioneer attempt to westernize the Ottoman army, Sultan wanted to, who succeeded after half a lifetime of patient waiting, in executing his martyr cousin's political testa. Meant, and, last but not least, President Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who completed, in our lifetime, the totalitarian revolution in Ottoman Turkish life that Sultan Selim had initiated some six generations earlier. These Ottoman names recall their counterparts elsewhere, the arch-westernizer Peter the Great and his Bolshevik executors, the shrewd architects of the Meiji Restoration in Japan, the Bengali syncretist Ram Mohan Roy, who, by carrying the issue onto the terrain of religion, showed the characteristic blind of feeling for the true reative values of matter and spirit however indignantly tire orthodox Hindu pundits of the day might shake the dust of this heresy arch's defiling threshold from off their own unprofitably unsullied feet. At the inspiration or behest of these mighty T. Erodians and the driving force has usually been a cross between persuasion and compulsion a younger generation of non-Westerners from all the once separate societies which the West has now swept together in its world enveloping net has literally been coming to school in the West in R. 9 In proceeding with the writing of his history of his own times, A. 1 Gabardi dealt as faithfully with M. C. H. M. E. D. Ali as with Napoleon or Abdullah Menu. In an evil hour for the historian, the dictator heard of his work and instituted inquiries into its contents, and, after that, Al Gabardi's record of Mermd Al's deeds was abruptly terminated. Riding home on his ass one dark night, to be exact, it was the night of the 27th Ramadan, AH 1237, alias June 22, 1822, our two truthful informants softly and silently vanished away, his adverse judgment 011 Islamic justice had been prophetic. Day. They are taking Western lessons at first hand in the universities of Paris and Cambridge and Oxford, at Columbia and at Chicago, and, as I was scanning the faces of my audience in the Senate blouse of the University of London, I saw to my pleasure a contingent of their representatives. There. An elite in all the non-Western societies has in fact by now successfully re-educated itself out of its traditional self-centered parochial point of view. Some of them, alas, have caught, instead, the Western ideological disease of nationalism, but even nationalism has, for non-Westerners, 
at least the negative merit of being an exotic infirmity. It, too, draws them out of their ancestral shell. In short, by one road or another, the emotionally upsetting but intellectually stimulating experience of being taken by storm by the West has educated these non-Western students of human affairs into realizing, and what an effort of imagination this Im implies, that the past history of the West is not just the West's own parochial concern but is their past history too. It is theirs because the West like those housebreaking French soldiers at Cairo whose execution by Napoleon al Gabardi records has thrust its way into its defenseless neighbors' lives, and these neighbors must therefore familiarize themselves with Western history if they are to learn how to take their bearings in a new worldwide society of which we Westerners have made them members by main force. The paradox of our generation is that all the world has now profited by an education which the West has provided, except, as we have observed already, the West herself. The West today is still looking at history from that old parochial self-centered standpoint which the other living societies have by now been compelled to transcend. One yet, sooner or later, the West, in her turn, is bound to receive the re-education which the other civilizations have obtained already from the unification of the world by Western action. What is the probable course of this coming Western mental and moral revolution? Wending our way, as we have to do, with our noses up against an iron curtain that debars us from foreseeing our own future, we may perhaps gain some illuminating sidelights from the histories of older contemporaries where we know the whole story because the dramatis personae have already departed this life. What, for instance, was the sequel to the impact of the Greco-Roman civilization on its neighbors? If we follow the thread through 16 or 17 centuries, from the catabasis of Xenophon's 10,000 companions in arms to the latest achievements of Greek-inspired Muslim science and philosophy before the Mongol cataclysm, we shall see an apparently irresistible Greek offensive on the military, political, economic, intellectual and artistic planes being progressively contained, halted, and thrown into reverse by the countermeasures of its non-Greek victims. On all the planes on which they had been attacked, the Orientals' counter-offensive was successful on the whole, but it was checkered in its fortunes and sometimes ironical in its consequences. There is, however, one point religion, the Greeks' Achilles' heel at which the Oriental counterstroke went home and made history. This fully told yet all but contemporary talc has an evident bearing on our own prospects, for a spiritual vacuum like the hollow place at the heart of that Hellenic culture which the Greeks temporarily imposed on the world has latterly made its appearance in the culture of our Western Christendom in the form in which this culture has been processed for export. For some 200 years, dating from the beginning of the Dagaman era, our world-storming Western forefathers made a valiant attempt to propagate abroad the whole of our Western cultural heritage including its religious core as well as its technological rind, and in this they were surely well inspired, for every culture is a whole whose parts are subtly interdependent, and to export the husk without the grain may be as deadly as to radiate the satellite electrons of an atom without the nucleus. However, about the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries of our Western Christian era, something happened which, I venture to prophesy, is going to loom out in retrospect as one of the epoch-making events of our modern Western history when this local history is seen in its true light as an incident in the general history of mankind. This portent was a double event, in which the Jesuits' failure was accentuated by the Royal Society's simultaneous success. The Jesuits failed to convert the Hindus and Chinese to the Roman Catholic form of Western Christianity. They failed, though they had discovered the psychological know-how, because, when it came to the point, neither the Pope nor the Son of Heaven nor the Brahmans would have it. In the same generation, these tragically frustrated Jesuit missionaries fellow Western Catholics and Protestants at home came to the hazardous conclusion that a religion in whose now divided and contentious name they had been fighting an inconclusive fratricidal hundred years war was an inopportune element in their cultural heritage. Why not tacitly agree to cut out the wars of religion by cutting out religion itself and concentrate on the application of physical science to practical affairs a pursuit which aroused no controversy and which promised to be lucrative? This 17th century turning in the road of Western progress was big. With consequences, 
for the Western civilization that has since run like wildfire round the world has not been the whole of the seamless web, it has been a flare of cotton waste, a technological selvage with the religious centerpiece torn out. This utility pattern of Western civilization was, of course, comparatively easy to take, Peter the Great revealed his genius by instantly pouncing on it as soon as it was displayed in the West's shop window. A hundred years later, the subtler and more spiritual Al Gabardi showed a nicer discrimination. French technology hit him in the eye, but he persisted in waiting for a sign. For him, the touchstone of Western civilization, as of his own, was not technology but justice. This Karine scholar had apprehended the heart of the matter, the issue which the West has still to fight out within itself. And though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have not charity, I am nothing ten or what man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or, if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? 11. This brings us back to a question, raised by a sentence of Al Gabardi's, which is still awaiting our answer. Which really was the most important event of A.H. 1213? Napoleon's invasion of Egypt or the intermission of the annual pilgrimage from Egypt to the holy cities in the high jazz. The Islamic institution of the pilgrimage is of course, in itself, nothing more than an exacting external observance, but, as a symbol, it stands for the fraternal spirit that binds all Muslims together. Islam is therefore in danger when the pilgrimage falls off, as we have learned by experience in our own asterisk lifetime, and Al Gabardi was sensitive to this danger 10 1 cor, 13. 2, 11 Matville 9 to 10. Because he valued the spiritual treasure with which his ancestral religion was freighted. What value are we to place on Islam ourselves? In a chapter of world history in which the mastery of the world seems likely to lie in the hands of the conspicuously infrapigmented and notoriously race-conscious transmarine English-speaking peoples. Can mankind afford to do without the social cement of Islamic fraternity? Yet this social service, valuable and noble though it be, is not the essence of Islam as Al Gabardi would have been quick to point out to us, though he happened, himself, to be a living embodiment of this particular virtue of his faith. As his surname records, Al Gabardi was hereditary master of one of those nations that were the constituents of the University of Al Azhar, as they were of its contemporary the Sorbonne. And who were his nation of the Gabart? They were the Trans-Abyssinian Galas and Somalis, true-believing ebony-colored children of Ham. You will perceive that our hero's surname and personal name were felicitously matched, surname Al-Gabardi the Ethiop, personal name Abdar Rahman the servant of the God of Mercy. Yet this worshipper of a compassionate God would have testy. Fide that, if the pilgrimage is merely the symbol of a fraternity transcending differences of color and class, this unity between true believers is, in turn, merely a translation into action here on earth of their true belief in the unity of God. Islam's creative gift to mankind is monotheism, and we surely dare not throw this gift away. And what about the Battle of the Pyramids? Last year, when, for the second time in my life, I was attending a peace conference in Paris, I found myself, one Sunday morning, sitting on a temporary wooden stand and watch. In the French victory march defiling past me spa his own. Dancing white horses, and Tunisian light infantry led by a sedately drilled and smartly caparisoned sheep with the Arc de Triomphe staring me in the face on the farther side of the procession's route. Staring back at that imposing pile of masonry, my eye began to travel along the row of round shields below the cornice each bearing the name of one of Napoleon's victories. It is perhaps a good thing, I caught myself thinking, as my eye reached the corner, that this monument is only foursquare and not octagonal, for, if they had had more room, they would have had to come, in the end, to Sedan and the Battle of France. And then my mind flitted to the equally iron eichel ends of other chains of national glories, a German chain in which the Battle of France had been followed within four years by the Battle of Germany, and a British chain of victories in India beginning with Plassey and Assasi and running through the sonorous Punjabi names of stricken fields in the Anglo-Sikh wars. What, in the final account, did these Western national victories amount to? 
to the same zero figure as the national victories nor less famous in their day of those Chinese contending states which Tizen Shi Huangdi swept off the map in the 3rd century HC. Vanity of vanities. But Islam remains, with a mighty spiritual mission still to carry out. So who has the last laugh in this controversy over Al Gabardi's sense of proportion? A.I. Gabardi's Western readers or Al Gabardi himself 5. Now, what must we Westerners do if we aspire, like Kleenthks, to follow the beck of Zeus and fate by using our intelligence and exercising our free will, instead of constraining those dread deities to bring us into line by the humiliating method of compulsion? First, I would suggest, we must readjust our own his. Historical outlook on the lines on which the educated representatives of our sister societies have been readjusting theirs during these last few generations. Our non-Western contemporaries have grasped the fact that, in consequence of the recent unification of the world, our past history has become a vital part of theirs. Reciprocally, we mentally still slumbering Westerners have now to realize, on our part, that, in virtue of the same revolution a revolution, after all, that has been brought about by ourselves our neighbor's past is going to become a vital part of our own Western future. In rousing ourselves to make this effort of imagination we do not have to start quite from the beginning. We have always realized and acknowledged our debt to Israel, Greece and Rome. But these, of course, are extinct civilizations, and we have managed to pay our homage to them without budging from our traditional self-centered standpoint because we have taken it for granted in the blindness of our egotism that our noble selves are those dead civilizations raison d'etre we imagined them living and dying for the sake of preparing the way for us playing John the Baptist to our own role as the Christie backslash I apologize for the blasphemy of this comparison, but it does bring out sharply how outrageously distorted our outlook has been. We have latterly also realized the importance, as contributors to our own past, of certain other civilizations which were not only extinct but which had lain buried in oblivion before we disinterred their debris. It is easy for us to be generous in our acknowledgments to Minoans, Hittites and Sumerians, for their rediscovery has been a feather in our Western scholars' cap, and they have made their reappearance on the stage of history under our patronage. It will be harder for us to accept the not less plain fact that the past histories of our vociferous, and sometimes vituperative, living contemporaries the Chinese and the Japanese, the Hindus and the Muslims, and our elder brothers the Orthodox Christians are going to become a part of our Western past history in a future world which will be neither Western nor non-Western Burr will inherit all the cultures which we Westerners have now brewed together in a single crucible. Yet this is the manifest truth when we face it. Our own descendants are not going to be just Western, like ourselves. They are going to be heirs of Confucius and Lao Tse as well as Socrates, Plato and Plotinus, heirs of Gautama Buddha as well as Dkutero Isaiah and Jesus Christ, heirs of Zarathustra and Muhammad, as well as Elijah and Elisha and Peter and Paul, heirs of Shankara and Ramanuj as well as Clement and Origen heirs of the Cappadocian Fathers of the Orthodox Church as well as our African Augustine and our Umbrian Benedict, heirs of Ibn Khaldun as well as Boswet, and heirs. If still wallowing in the Serbonian bog of politics, of Lenin and Gandhi and Sun Yat-sen as well as Cromwell and George Washington and Matsina, a readjustment of historical outlook demands a corresponding revision of methods of historical study. Recapturing, if we can, an old-fashioned mode of thought and feeling, let us confess, with great humility, that, through the providence of God, the historic achievement of Western man has been to do something not simply for himself but for mankind as a whole something so big that our own parochial history is going to be swallowed up by the results of it. By making history we have transcended our own history. Without knowing what we have been doing we have taken the opportunity offered to us. To be allowed to fulfill oneself by surpassing oneself is a glorious privilege for any of God's creatures. On this view then a humble view and yet a proud view to the main strand of our modern Western history is not the parish pump politics of our Western society as inscribed on triumphal arches in a half dozen parochial capitals or recorded in the national and municipal archives of ephemeral great powers. The main strand is not even. The expansion of the West over the world so long as we persist in thinking of that expansion as a private enterprise of the Western society's own. 
The main strand is the progressive erection, by Western hands, of a scaffolding within which all the once separate societies have built themselves into one. From the beginning, mankind has been partitioned, in our day we have at last become united. The Western handiwork that has made this union possible has not been carried out with open eyes, like David's unselfish labors for the benefit of Solomon, it has been performed in heedless ignorance of its purpose, like the labors of the animalculae that build a coral reef up from the bottom of the sea till at length an atoll rises above the waves. But our Western-built scaffolding is made of less durable materials than that. The most obvious ingredient in it is technology, and man cannot live by technology alone. In the fullness of time, when the ecumenical house of many mansions stands firmly on its own foundations and the temporary Western technological scaffolding falls away as I have no doubt that it will I believe it will become manifest that the foundations are firm at last because they have been carried down to the bedrock of religion. We have reached the pillars of Hercules and it is time to draw in sail, for W.C. cannot see clearly very much farther ahead. In the chapter of history on which we are now entering, the seat of material power is moving at this moment still farther away from its predagamon locus. From the small island of Britain, lying a stone's throw from the Atlantic coast of the continent of Asia, it is moving to the larger island of North America, a bowshot farther distant. But this transfer of Poseidon's trident from London to New York may prove to have marked the culmination of the dislocating effects of our current oceanic age of intercommunication, for W.C. Arc now passing into a new age in which the material medium of human intercourse is going to be neither the steppe nor the ocean, but the air, and in an air age mankind may succeed in shaking its wings free from their floodgellying bondage to the freakish configuration of the surface solid or liquid of the globe. In an air age the locus of the center of gravity of human affairs may be determined not by physical but by human geography, not by the layout of oceans and seas, steppes and deserts, rivers and mountain ranges, passes and straits, but by the distribution of human numbers, energy, ability, skill and character. And, among these human factors, the weight of numbers may eventually come to count for more than its influence in the past. The separate civilizations of the pre dagaman age were created and enjoyed, as we have observed, by a tiny sophisticated ruling minority perched on the back of a Neolithic peasantry, as Sinbad. The sailor was ridden by the old man of the sea. This Neolithic peasantry is the last and mightiest sleeper, before herself, whom the West has waked. The rousing of this passively industrious mass of humanity has been a slow business. Athens and Florence each flashed her brief candle in the sleeper's drowsy eyes but each time he just turned onto his side and sank to sleep again. It was left for modern England to urbanize the peasantry with sufficient energy on a large enough scale to set the movement traveling round the circumference of the earth. The peasant has not taken this awakening kindly. Even in the Americas he has contrived to remain much as he was in Mexico and the Andean republics, and he has struck new roots on virgin soil in the province of Quebec. Yet the process of his awakening has been gathering momentum, the French Revolution carried it on to the continent, the Russian Revolution has propagated it from coast to coast, and, though today there are still some 1500 million not yet awakened peasants about three quarters of the living generation of mankind in India, China, Indochina, Indonesia, Dar al Islam, and Eastern Europe, their awakening is now only a matter of time, and, when it has been accomplished, numbers will begin to tell. Their gravitational pull may then draw the center point of human affairs away from an Ultima Thule among the Isles of the Sea to some locus approximately equidistant from the western pole of the world's population in Europe and North America and its eastern pole in China and India, and this would indicate a site in the neighborhood of Babylon, on the ancient portage across the isthmus between the continent and its peninsulas of Arabia and Africa. The center might even travel farther into the interior of the continent to some locus between China and Russia, the two historic tamers of the Eurasian nomads, and that would indicate a site in the neighborhood of Babur's Fargana, in the familiar Transoxanian meeting place and debating ground of the religions and philosophies of India, China, Iran, Syria, and Greece. Of one thing we can be fairly confident. Religion is likely to be the plane on which this coming centripetal counter-movement will first declare itself, 
and this probability offers us a further hint for the revision of our traditional Western methods of studying history. If our first precept should be to study our own history, not on its own account but for the part which the West has played in the unification of mankind, our second precept, in studying history as a whole, should be to relegate economic and political history to a subordinate place and give religious history the primacy. For religion, after all, is the serious business of the human race. Note on the part played by opium in Sino-British relations the terms in which this subject has been referred to m the foregoing essay may be supported by the following summary of the facts which is based on 1 williamson j a and other members of the historical association common errors in history london 1945 king and staples 11 pratt sir j war and politics in china london 1943 cape 3 coston w C. Great Britain and China, 1833 to 1860, Oxford, 1937, Clarendon Press, 4, Morse, H. B. The International Relations of the Chinese Empire: The Period of Conflict, 2834 to 1860, London, 1910, Longmans, Green. None of the authors of these works are Chinese; all are Westerners. All but one are British subjects. The author of 4 is a citizen of the United States. 1. The smoking of opium, which is the most noxious way of taking the drug, was first introduced into China by the Dutch, from Java. 2. Addiction to opium smoking came to be far more widespread in China than elsewhere, for example, than M. British India, which came to be the chief, though never sole, source of opium production in the world and of opium importation into China. 3. The British government M. India assumed a monopoly of the sale of opium in their dominions in A.D. 1773 and I. 797. 4. In A.N. 1800 the Chinese government forbade both the cultivation of the opium poppy in China and its importation from abroad, opium smoking had long SME been a penal offence in China. 5. Before A.D. 1830 the policy of the British Indian government was to restrict the consumption of opium, at home and abroad, by charging a high price, from A.D. 1830 onwards they followed the opposite policy of winning the maximum revenue from opium by stimulating consumption through lowering the price. This had the double effect of greatly increasing the amount of opium smuggled MTO China and of increasing the amount of revenue accruing to the Indian government, Pratt, Op. CIT carrot P44. 6. The British government in India were unwilling, until AD 1907, to make the sacrifice of revenue that would be entailed M putting an embargo on the export of opium from India to China, the British Indian government's opium revenue rose from about carrot L000 asterisk 000 per annum in the years 1820 to 43 to over carat 7, 000, 000 in 1910 to 11. 7 in the period AD 1800 to 1858, during which the importation of opium into China was illegal, the lion's share of the smuggling trade was done by riotous ships. 8. The British government in the United Kingdom never made this smuggling trade illegal for British subjects and they discountenanced compliance with the Chinese government's demand that foreign merchants should sign bonds undertaking not to smuggle opium MTO China and accepting a liability to suffer capital punishment for this offence at the hands of the Chinese authorities if the offenders were caught and convicted. 9. The smuggling trade would not have been, a, lucrative, if there had not been a keen demand for opium among the Chinese public, or, b, feasible if the British and other foreign smugglers had not had energetic Chinese confederates. Ten most Chinese officials were unwise and incompetent, and some of them corrupt, and their handling of the particular problem of opium smuggling and the general problem of doing business with Western traders and with the representatives of Western governments, a, they treated representatives of Western governments as if they were the agents of client princes and Western traders as though they were barbarians, b, they failed to put down the smuggling of opium into China, c. Some of them connived at the smuggling and participated if its profits. 11. The British government in the United Kingdom were prevented, by the influence of the China Trade M Parliament, 
from giving their superintendents of trade M. China adequate authority over British subjects there during the critical years A.D. 1834-912, the Westerners justly complained that their legitimate trade was vexatiously restricted and that they were subjected to wanton personal humiliations. 13. The Chinese justly complained, a, that the advent of Western traders had brought on China the curse of opium smuggling on a large scale, M.A.D. 1836 The value of the opium smuggled MTO China was greater than the combined value of the tea and silk legitimately exported, b, that British and other Western sailors in the port of Canton were drunken, riotous, and homicidal. 14. In 1839, a Chinese imperial commissioner, Lin Tsesu, succeeded, by a bloodless boycott and blockade of the Western merchants at Canton, M. Compelling the British Chief Superintendent of the Trade of British Subjects M. China, Captain Charles Elliot, to cooperate with him M. Enforcing the surrender, by Western merchants, of 20,283 chests of opium, valued at over carat 11,000,000, at that time held by them on Chinese soil or in Chinese territorial waters. Commissioner Lin duly destroyed the confiscated opium but he failed to put an end to opium smuggling. Fifteen thereafter, hostilities were started by the British, first on September 4, 1839, at Kowloon in retaliation for a refusal of permission to purchase food supplies, and then on November 3, 1839, at Chenpai, in retort to a Chinese demand for the surrender of the murderer of a Chinese. Subject, Lin Weihai, who had been fatally injured on July 7, at Kowloon in an indiscriminate assault on the Chinese civilian population by British, and perhaps also American, sailors who were trying to lay hands on intoxicating liquor. NB Captain Elliot had held a judicial inquiry into this incident on July 10 and had tried, but failed, to identify the murderer. 16 The British government in the United Kingdom had already taken steps to dispatch a naval and military expeditionary force to China after being informed of the action taken by Commissioner Lin but before receiving the news of the outbreak of hostilities. 17 The British government met with some opposition and censure, from a minority in Parliament and among the public, for making war on China in A.D. 1839-42-18. In the peace treaty signed at Nanking on August 29, 1842, the British compelled the Chinese to open treaty ports and to cede territory, but not to legalize the opium traffic. 19. At the instance of the British government, the Chinese government agreed, on October 13, 1858, to legalize the importation of opium into China after defeat in a second SMO British war and 58 years' experience of failure to prevent the smuggling traffic. 20. As between the Chinese and the British, the issue over opium was eventually closed, a, by the progressive reduction, Pan Pasu, during the years 1907 to 1919, of opium. Cultivation in China and the importation of opium into China from India, by agreement between the Chinese and British Indian governments, b, by the total prohibition of exports of opium from British India in Ajd. 1926 NB. As a result of political anarchy in China, followed by Japanese invasion and occupation, the cultivation of the opium poppy in China afterwards became rife again. 6. The dwarfing of Europe won before the War of 1914-18, Europe enjoyed an undisputed ascendancy in the world, and the special form of civilization which had been developing in Western Europe during the past 1200 years seemed likely to prevail everywhere. The ascendancy of Europe was marked by the fact that five out of the eight great powers then existing that is to say, the British Empire, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy had their roots in European soil. A sixth, the Russian Empire, lay in the immediate continental hinterland of the European peninsula, and during the last two and a half centuries it had become welded onto Europe partly by the growth of a great trade between agrarian Russia and industrial Europe, a trade which had developed peri passa with the industrialization of Western and Central European countries, partly by the political incorporation in Russia of a fringe of countries with a asterisk this paper is based on a lecture delivered in London on the October 26, 1926, with Dr. Hugh Dalton in the chair, in a series, organized by the Fabian Society, 
under the general title of the shrinking world asterisk dangers and possibilities slash in the course of the intervening 20 years, many of these possibilities have become accomplished facts. Western tradition of European civilization, such as Poland, Finland and the Baltic provinces, and partly by the adoption of Western technique, institutions and ideas on the part of the Russians themselves. The two remaining great powers Japan and the United States were geographically non-European, and for that very reason they took little part, before the First World War, in the play of international politics a play which was performed at that time on a European stage. It may be pointed out, however, that Japan, like Russia, had only risen to the rank of a great power through a partial adoption of that Western civilization of which Western Europe was the home. As for the United States, she was the child of Western Europe and, down to 1914, she was still drawing heavily upon European capital human capital in the form of immigrants and material capital in the form of goods and services financed by European loans in order to develop her latent natural resources. This ascendancy of Europe in the world went hand in hand with the spread of Western civilization. The two movements were complementary, and it would be impossible to say that either was the cause or the effect of the other. Naturally, the spread of Western civilization was facilitated by the ascendancy of Europe, because the strong and de-efficient are always imitated by the dot weak and inefficient partly out of necessity, and de pa rtly from admiration, whether this admiration is avowed or not. On the other hand, the spread of Western civilization gave those peoples among whom it was indigenous an inestimable advantage in competition with those among whom it was exotic. During the century ending in 1914, the world was conquered economically not only by the new Western Indus trial system but by the Western nations among whom that system had been invented, and the advantage possessed by an inventor in a battle fought with his own weapons was illustrated strikingly in the First World War itself. The fact that the War of 1914-18 was fought on the lines of Western military technique which was of course an application of Western industrial technique gave Germany an absolute military superiority over Russia, though German manpower was only half as great as Russian at the time. Had the Central Asian, and not the Western, technique of warfare been predominant in the world during the years 1914-18, as it had been during the Middle Ages? the Russian Cossacks might have overwhelmed the Prussian Uhlans. Both these types of cavalry had a Central Asian origin which is betrayed by their Turkish names Okalan being the Turkish for boy slash and Kazakh for digger. The predominance of the Western civilization throughout the world, on the eve of the fateful year 1914, was, indeed, both recent and unprecedented. It was unprecedented in this sense that, though many civilizations before that of Europe had radiated their influence far beyond their original homelands, none had previously cast its net right round the globe. The civilization of Eastern Orthodox Christendom, which grew up in medieval Byzantium, had been carried by the Russians to the Pacific, but, so far from spreading westwards, it had itself succumbed to Western influence since the close of the 17th century. The civilization of Islam had expanded from the Middle East to Central Asia and Central Africa, to the Atlantic coast of Morocco and the Pacific coasts of the East Indies, but it had obtained no permanent foothold in Europe and had never crossed the Atlantic into the New World. The civilization of ancient Greece and Rome had extended its political dominion into northwestern Europe under the Roman Empire and its artistic inspiration into India and the Far East where Greco-Roman models had stimulated the development of Buddhist art. Yet the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire had coexisted on the face of the same planet for two centuries with scarcely any direct intercourse, either political or economic. Indeed, so slight was the contact that each of these two societies saw the other, through a glass darkly, as a half-mythical fairyland. In other words, the Greco-Roman civilization and the contemporary Far Eastern civilization each expanded to their full capacity, in the same age, without coming into collision. It was the same with the other ancient civilizations. Ancient India radiated her religion, her art, her commerce and her colonists into the Far East and the East Indies, but never penetrated the West. The civilization of the Sumerians in the land of Shinar exerted an influence as far afield as the Indus Valley and Transcaspia and southeastern Europe, but attempts to prove that it was the parent of the early Chinese civilization on the one side, or of the Egyptian on the other, 
have miscarried. There is a brilliant and rather militant school of English anthropologists who maintain that all known civilizations including those of Central America and Peru can be traced back to an Egyptian origin. And these anthropologists point to the present worldwide extension of our Western civilization as an analogy in support of their thesis. If our own civilization has become worldwide in our own time, they argue, why should not the Egyptian civilization have achieved an equal extension a few thousand years earlier? This thesis is in ter. S. Daying, but it is the subject of acute controversy and must be regarded as non proven. As far as we know for certain, the only civilization that has ever yet become worldwide is ours. Moreover, this is a very recent event. Nowadays we are apt to forget that Western Europe made two unsuccessful attempts to expand before she eventually succeeded. The first of these attempts was the medieval movement in the Mediterranean for which the most convenient general name is the Crusades. In the Crusades, the attempt to impose the political and economic dominion of West Europeans upon other peoples ended in a complete failure, while, in the interchange of culture, the West Europeans received a greater impress from the Muslims and Byzantines than they imparted to them. The second attempt was that of the Spaniards and Portuguese in the 16th century of our era. This was more or less successful in the New World the modern Latin American communities owe their existence to it but, elsewhere, Western civilization, as propagated by the Spaniards and Portuguese, was rejected after about a century's trial. The expulsion of the Spaniards and Portuguese from Japan, and of the Portuguese from Abyssinia, in the second quarter of the 17th century, marked the failure of this second attempt. The third attempt was begun in the 17th century by the Dutch, French, and English, and these three West European nations were the principal authors of the worldwide ascendancy that our Western civilization was enjoying in 1914. The English, French, and Dutch peopled North America, South Africa, and Australasia with new nations of European stock which started life with the Western social heritage, and they brought the rest of the world within the European orbit. By 1914, the network of European trade and European means of communication had become worldwide. Almost the whole world had entered the Postal Union and the Telegraphic Union, and European devices for mechanical locomotion the steamship, the railway, the motorcar were rapidly penetrating everywhere. On the plane of politics, the European nations had not only colonized the New World but had conquered India and tropical Africa. The political ascendancy of Europe, however, though outwardly even more imposing than her economic ascendancy, was really more precarious. The daughter nations overseas had already set their feet firmly on the road towards independent nationhood. The United States and the Latin American republics had long since established their independence by revolutionary wars, and the self-governing British dominions were in process of establishing theirs by peaceful evolution. In India and tropical Africa, European domination was being maintained by a handful of Europeans who lived there as pilgrims and sojourners. They had not found it possible to acclimatize themselves sufficiently to bring up their children in the tropics, and this meant that the hold of Europeans upon the tropics had not been made independent of a European base of operations. Finally, the cultural influence of the West European civilization upon Russians, Muslims, Hindus, Chinese, Japanese, and tropical Africans was so recent a ferment that it was not yet possible to predict whether it would evaporate without permanent effect, or whether it would turn the dough sour, or whether it would successfully leaven the lump. This then, in very rough outline, was the position of Europe in the world on the eve of the War of 1914-18. She was in the enjoyment of an undisputed ascendancy, and the peculiar civilization which she had built up for her self was in process of becoming worldwide. Yet this position, brilliant though it was, was not merely unprecedented and recent, it was also insecure. It was insecure chiefly because, at the very time when European expansion was approaching its climax, the foundation of West European civilization had been broken up and the great deeps loosed. By the release and emergence of two elemental forces in European social life, the forces of industrialism and democracy, which were brought into a merely temporary and unstable equilibrium by the formula of nationalism. 
It is evident that a Europe which was undergoing the terrific double strain of this inward transformation and outward expansion both on the heroic scale could not with impunity squander her resources, spend her material wealth and manpower unproductively, or exhaust her muscular and nervous energy. If her total command of resources was considerably greater than that which any other civilization had ever enjoyed, these resources were relative to the calls upon them, and the liabilities of Europe on the eve of 1914 as well as her assets, were of an unprecedented magnitude. Europe could not afford to wage even one world war, and when we take stock of her position in the world after a second world war and compare it with her position before 1914, we are confronted with a contrast that is staggering to the imagination. In a certain sense, Europe still remains the center of the world, and in a certain sense, again, the world is still being leavened by that Western civilization of which Western Europe is the original home, but the sense in which these two statements are still true has changed so greatly that the bare statements are misleading without a commentary. Instead of being a center from which energy and initiative radiate outwards, Europe has become a center upon which non-European energy and initiative converge. Instead of the world being a theater for the play of European activities and rivalries, Europe herself after having been the cockpit in two world wars in which the world did its fighting on European soil is now in danger of becoming for a third time an arena for conflicts between non-European forces. An arena still may be defined as a central, public place, but it is hardly a place of honor or security. It is true, again, that the influence of our Western civilization upon the rest of the world is still at work. Indeed its action has become intensified, if we measure it in purely quantitative terms. For example, before the two wars, the new facilities for travel were only available for a wealthy minority of Europeans and Americans. During the wars, these facilities were turned to account to transport not only Europeans and Americans but Asiatics and Africans, en masse, to fight, or to labor behind the front, in war zones all over the world. During the last 20 or 30 years, additional means of mechanical communication have been made available, not merely for a minority but for large sections of society. The motor car has learned to conquer the desert, the aeroplane has outsped the motor car, and the radio has reinforced the telephone and telegraph as a means of instantaneous long-distance intercourse. Unlike the railway and the telegraph, the motor car and the radio set can be owned and employed by private individuals a feature which greatly enhances their efficacy as media of communication. With the wholesale intermingling of peoples during the two wars, and with these new mechanical aids to communication after them, it is not surprising to find that the leaven of Western civilization is penetrating the world more widely, deeply, and rapidly now than before. At this moment, we see peoples like the Chinese and the Turks, who within living memory seemed bound hand and foot by the Confucian and the Islamic social heritage, adopting not merely the material technique of the West, the industrial system and all its works, and not merely the externals of our culture, trifles like felt hats and cinemas, but our social and political institutions, the Western status of women, the Western method of education, the Western machinery of parliamentary representative government. In this, the Turks and Chinese are only conspicuous participants in a movement which is spreading over the whole of the Islamic world, the whole of the Hindu world, the whole of the Far East, the whole of tropical Africa, and it looks almost as though a radical westernization of the entire world were now inevitable. Insensibly, our attitude towards this extraordinary process has changed. Formerly, it caught our attention in the two apparently isolated cases of Japan and Russia, and we thought of these two cases as sports do, perhaps, to some exceptional quality in the social heritage of these two countries which made their people specially susceptible to westernization, or do, perhaps, alternatively, to the personal genius and forcefulness of individual statesmen like Peter the Great and Catherine and Alexander the Liberator and that group of Japanese elder statesmen who deliberately imposed the adoption of Western ways upon the mass of their fellow countrymen from the 1860s onwards. Now we see that Japan and Russia were simply forerunners of a movement which was to become universal. As Europeans observe this process of the westernization of the world and watch it gathering momentum under their eyes, they may be inclined to exclaim almost in a spirit of exaltation, what does it matter if Europe really has lost her ascendancy in the world, 
if the whole world is becoming European, Europe si monumentu vi requires, circumspice be that mood of exaltation, however, if it did for a moment. Capture European minds, would rapidly be dispelled by doubts. The propagation of Western culture from Europe over the world may be a great thing quantitatively, but what about quality? If at this instant Europe were to be blotted out of the Book of Life, would the Western civilization be able to maintain its European standard in the foreign environments to which it has been transplanted? 5. If Europe were blotted out altogether, could the Western civilization even survive? And with Europe still alive, but deposed from her former position of supremacy which is manifestly the fate that has overtaken her will the Western civilization, though saved from extinction, escape? Degeneration? Still more alarming doubts suggest themselves when we contemplate the modern history of Russia and Russia is the most instructive case to consider, because in Russia the process of westernization has had longer than elsewhere to work itself out. In Russia, the leaven of Western Europe has been at work for two centuries longer than in Japan or China, and for a century longer than among the Muslims and the Hindus. Thus, the point to which the current of westernization has carried Russia by now enables us to foresee, by analogy, at any rate one of the possibilities that lie before the Far East, Islam, India and Africa in the course of the next few generations. This possibility which is revealed by the case of Russia and of course it is no more than one possibility among a number. Burr of alternatives is a disconcerting one for Western minds to contemplate. The Europeans have regarded themselves as the chosen people they need feel no shame in admitting that. Every past civilization has taken this view of itself and its own heritage and, as they have watched the Gentiles, one after another, casting aside their own heritage in order to take up Europe's instead, they have unhesitatingly congratulated both themselves and their cultural converts. One more sinner, Europeans have repeated to themselves devoutly, has repented of the filthy devices of the heathen and become initiated into the true faith. Now the first effects of the conversion at any rate. Among the peoples converted to Western civilization before the wars appeared to bear out this pious and optimistic view. For half a century after the revolution of 1868, Japan seemed to have come unscathed through the tremendous transformation to which she had committed herself, and Russia would have been pronounced by a detached observer who took stock of her in 1815, or even as lately as 1914 to have been set by Peter the Great upon the road of progress though in her case the road might have appeared to be longer, steeper, and more toilsome than in the case of Japan. A fair-minded observer of Russia, at either of those dates, would have admitted that the standard of Western civilization in a recently westernized Russia was far lower than in a Europe where that civilization was at home, but he would have pleaded that, in spite of this backwardness, and in spite of disappointingly frequent setbacks, Russia was rapidly catching up the European vanguard in the march of Western civilization. Remember, he would have said, that, in this forward march, Europe had ten centuries start, and you will admit that. The pace at which Russia is catching up to Europe is very creditable. But what would the same fair-minded observer say about Russia today? I do not propose to speculate on the moral judgment that he would pass that is irrelevant to my subject but, whatever his judgments of value might be, I think. He could hardly avoid making the two following judgments of fact, first, that the gospel according to Lenin and Stalin draws its inspiration from the West every bit as much as the gospel according to Peter and Alexander, and, second, that the effect of the West upon Russia has changed over from positive to negative. The Russian prophets of the first dispensation were inspired by a set of Western ideas which attracted them towards the social heritage of our Western civilization. The Russian prophets of the Second Dispensation have been attracted by another set of ideas which are also of Western origin, but which lead them to regard the West as a kind of apocalyptic. Babylon We cannot comprehend the total effect of Westernization upon Russia up to date unless we see this Bolshevik reaction of the 20th century and the Petrine reaction of the 17th century in perspective as successive, and perhaps inseparable phases in a single process which the encounter between two different civilizations has set up. In this perspective we shall come to regard the process of westernization with less complacency, and shall find ourselves reciting the parable, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and, 
Finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. From a Western standpoint, the unclean spirit which originally possessed Russia was her Byzantine social heritage. When Peter the Great went on his pilgrimage to Europe and beheld Solomon in all his glory, there was no more spirit left in him. Byzantinism did not, indeed, go out of Russia, but it did go underground, and for ten generations the Russian people walked through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Unable to endure existence in a swept and garnished house, they flung their doors wide open and summoned all the spirits of the West to enter in and dwell there, and in crossing the threshold these spirits have turned into seven devils. The moral seems to be that a social heritage will not readily bear transplantation. Culture spirits which are the tutelary geniuses, the lares and panades, of the house where they are at home and where there is a pre-established harmony between them and the human inhabitants, become demons of malevolence and destruction when they enter into a house inhabited by strangers, for these strangers are naturally ignorant of the subtle rites in which their new God's souls delight. As long as the Ark of Jehovah remained in Israel among Jehovah's chosen people, it served them as their talisman, but, when the Ark was captured by the Philistines, the hand of the Lord was heavy upon every city in which it rested, and the chosen people themselves were infected with the plague by which the Gentiles were requited for their sacrilege. If this analysis is right, Europeans cannot take much comfort for the dethronement of Europe in the prospect that the influence of European civilization may yet become the dominant force in the world. They will be less impressed by the fact that this mighty force has been generated in Europe than by the equally evident fact that, at a certain stage in its operation, it is apt to take a violently destructive turn. Indeed. This destructive recoil of European influence abroad upon Europe herself seems to be one of the signal dangers to which Europe is exposed in the new position in which she finds herself since the wars. In order to estimate the other principal danger to which Europe is now exposed, we must turn our attention from the relations between Europe and Russia to the relations between Europe and the United States. The reversal in the relations between Europe and the United States since 1914 gives the measure in which the world movement centering in Europe has become centripetal instead of centrifugal. The United States, as she was in 1914, was a monument of the outward radiation of European energies during the previous three centuries. Her population of over 100 millions had been created by the manpower of Europe, and the volume of migration across the Atlantic was expanding, on a steeply ascending curve, down to the very year in which the First World War broke out. Again, the development of the material resources of the vast territory of the United States a territory comparable in area to the whole of Europe, excluding Russia was dependent not merely upon the influx of European manpower but upon the importation of European goods and the application of European services. The positive current of economic circulation, in the form of emigrants and goods and services, was flowing before 1914 from Europe into the United States, the negative current, in the form of remittances and payments of interest for goods and services supplied on credit, was flowing from the United States to Europe. As a result of the two wars, the direction of the current has been dramatically reversed. The facts are so notorious, they are so constantly and so deeply impressed upon our consciousness, that I almost feel that I ought to apologize to my readers for recalling them. From the moment when the First World War broke out, the stream of European emigrants to America ceased to flow, and, by the time the First War was over, the United States who had previously not only welcomed European immigrants but whose employers of labor had sought them in the highways and hedges of Europe and compelled them to come in had learned to feel that European immigration was not a national asset but a national danger that it was a transaction in which the balance of advantage was with the immigrant and not with the country which received him. This momentous change of attitude in the United States towards European immigration was promptly given practical expression in the two Restriction Acts of 1921 and 1924. The effect upon the economic life of Europe or, more accurately, 
of those European countries from which the largest contingents of emigrants to the United States had latterly been drawn was very far-reaching. Take the classic case of Italy. In 1914 the number of Italian immigrants into the United States was 283,738, by contrast, the Italian annual quota proclaimed by President Coolidge on the June 30, 1924, in pursuance of the act of that year, was 3,845. In consequence, the stream of Italian emigrants was partly dammed up and partly diverted from the vacuum in the United States a vacuum which had existed because America was a new world. In process of development to the vacuum in France a vacuum which had been created because Europe was an old world devastated by having been made into the battlefield of an ecumenical war. In the 18th century, French and English armies crossed the Atlantic in order to fight on the banks of the Ohio and the St. Lawrence for the possession of the North American continent. In the 20th century, American armies have crossed the Atlantic in order to decide the destinies of the world on European battlefronts. Till 1914, the fertilizing stream of European emigration to America was still increasing in volume. From 1921 onwards, this stream was being deliberately checked and during the interwar years it was replaced by an uneconomic trickle of American tourists to Europe. Of course, this interwar trickle of American tourists to Europe, though small and unproductive compared to the mighty river of emigrants which had formerly flowed from Europe to America, was very large compared to any other movement of travel for uneconomic purposes that there had ever been, and the fact that this tourist traffic could be financed brings me to the second point in which the relations between Europe and the United States have been reversed a point which is so obvious that I shall simply state it without dwelling on it. The United States had changed, almost in the twinkling of an eye, from being the greatest debtor country in the world to being the greatest creditor country, and, in spite of their traditional aversion to European entanglements, Americans were driven, by the necessities of the new economic situation, to seek markets on credit, in Europe, for American goods and services. But there was an unfortunate difference in kind between pre-war European investment in the United States and the interwar American investment in Europe. Before 1914, Europe provided the United States with credits for productive outlay. During the two wars, Europe borrowed from America the means of working her own destruction, and today she is borrowing desperately from America again not in order to develop new European resources, but merely to repair some part of the ravages which two world wars have inflicted on her. Confronted with this painful reversal in their relations with the United States, Europeans naturally ask themselves, is this an accidental, and therefore retrievable and merely temporary, misfortune and incidental consequence of exceptional catastrophes? Or has it older and deeper causes? the effect of which it will be less easy to counteract. I venture to suggest that this second possibility appears to be the more probable of the two that, although the two wars have precipitated this reversal of relations and have given it a revolutionary and dramatic outward form. Some such reversal was nevertheless inherent in the previous situation, and would have taken place though no doubt more gently and gradually even if these wars had never been fought. In support of this view, I shall put forward two points for consideration, first, the nature of the industrial system which Europe invented a century and a half ago and which has now spread all over the world, and, second, the fate of certain earlier centers of civilization for example, medieval Italy or ancient Greece which antici paid modern Europe in propagating their own civilization beyond their borders, though never quite so far and wide as modern Europe has propagated hers. First let us consider the industrial system. It was invented in Great Britain at a time when parliamentary rep. Resentative government within the framework of a national state had become the settled basis of English life. It immediately became apparent that a community built on the geographical scale of Great Britain, and possessing that cohesion and solidarity which the political institutions of representative government on the national scale had already given to Great Britain before the close of the 18th century, was the minimum unit of territory and population in which the industrial system could be operated with profit. The spread of industrialism from Great Britain across the European continent was, I should say, 
one of the main factors that produced the national unifications of Germany and Italy two notable political consolidations of territory and population in Europe which were completed within a century of the Industrial Revolution in England. About the year 1875, it looked as though Europe would find equilibrium through being organized into a number of industrialized democratic national states units of the caliber of Great Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, as they existed from 1871 to 1914. We can now see that this expectation of equilibrium, on the basis of the national unit, was illusory. Industrialism and democracy are elemental forces. In the 1870s they were still in their infancy, and we cannot yet foresee the ultimate dimensions to which they may grow or forecast the protean shapes which they may assume. What we can now pronounce with certainty is that the European national state of the dimensions attained by France and Great Britain in the 18th century and by Germany and Italy in the 19th is far too small and frail a vessel to contain these forces. The new wines of industrialism and democracy have been poured into old bottles and they have burst the old bottles beyond repair. It is now hardly conceivable that the ultimate minimum effective unit of the industrial system can be anything less than the entire utilizable surface of the planet and the whole of mankind. And, on the political plane, likewise, the minimum unit is showing a tendency to increase in scale, in sympathy with the extension, to a worldwide range, of the operations of industry. That tendency in the economic field has been fully matched in the political field by the emergence of worldwide political organizations, the United Nations and its precursor the League of Nations, and in this connection I would suggest that the economic and technical activities of the United Nations, though the least conspicuous, are not the least important. But, short of the worldwide United Nations organization, we see on the present political map certain elastic associations of self-governing nations like the British Commonwealth or the Pan-American Union, in each of which a considerable number of national states are grouped together. And within these two groups we can discern a number of political entities which are smaller and more closely knit than either of the associations to which they belong, yet at the same time are not nearly so small as typical European national states like France or Italy. These non-European polities of a supranational caliber have discovered a new political form adapted to their scale, they have abandoned the unitary centralized organization of the French type in favor of a federalism which combines the advantages of variety and devolution with those of uniform united action for purposes common to the whole union. Up to the present moment, the United States is the only country of this new type and caliber which has come of age and she has already given astonishing evidence of the economic power and energy which this new species of political organization is able to generate and release. We can perceive, however, that the United States is simply the first to reach maturity among a number of adolescent states which have organized themselves or are organizing themselves on a similar federal basis and on a comparable geographical scale. Apart from the United States, most of the new non-European states of this type still lack some element essential to the full exercise of their latent strength. The Commonwealth of Australia and the Argentine Federal Republic lack population, the Union of South Africa lacks population and is also confronted with the colour problem far more formidably than the United States. The rest lack either population, or education, or political experience and stability, or several of these requisites together and some of them are doubtless so heavily handicapped that they will fail to achieve their potentialities. It is not yet possible to forecast the future of the United States of Brazil, the Republic of Mexico, the Chinese Republic, the nascent polities of India and Pakistan, and the destiny of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is inscrutable. Yet, even though some of these still adolescent federal states of the overseas type and caliber may fall by the wayside, it is extremely probable that, within the next generation, there will have grown to maturity, outside Europe, at least as many federal states of the type and caliber of the United States as there are national states in Europe of the type and caliber of Great Britain, France, and Italy. More than one of these non-European states will be comparable in order of magnitude to the whole of Europe put together. Thus Europe as a whole is in process of being dwarfed by the overseas world which she herself has called into existence while the national states of Europe, singly, are being dwarfed by the federal states of this new world overseas. Faced with this situation, 
what future has Europe to expect. Some light on her future may be afforded by analogies from the past. After all, what Europe has achieved in the world, though possibly unprecedented in scale, is not unprecedented in character. Ancient Greece and medieval Italy both anticipated her. Each of these earlier societies was divided into a number of city-states, which were no more diminutive, in proportion to their respective worlds, than is a European national state in proportion to the world of today. Each of these societies created such a noble civilization and put forth such an intense and effectively directed energy that in spite of its internal disunion in spite of the passionate particularism of its city-states and their constant fratricidal struggles ancient Greece and medieval Italy each, in its day, succeeded in a stab. Lishing its political, economic and cultural ascendancy far and wide over the surrounding Gentiles. Each of them, in its great age set at defiance the dictum that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Yet their latter end was a tragic proof that the text is true. In either case, the chosen people taught the Gentiles to follow their way of life, and in either case the Gentiles learned to follow it, but on a far larger material scale. The city-states of Greece found themselves dwarfed by the greater powers the Macedonian, Syrian and Egyptian monarchies, the Carthaginian Empire, and the Roman Confederation which arose round the Mediterranean after the expansion of the Greek civilization in the age of Alexander, and Greece then became at once the pilgrimage resort, the university, and the battlefield of these new Hellenized powers. It was the same with medieval Italy and in her case the story has a special appositeness, for the new powers which were called into existence by the spread of the Italian Renaissance beyond the Alps, and which dwarfed and dominated the city-states of Milan and Florence and dot Venice from the end of the 15th century onwards, were those European national states such states as Spain and France which are now being dwarfed under our eyes by the United States of America. As we reflect on these precedents, two questions naturally suggest themselves, first, how was it that the converted Gentiles, who in all else were the passive pupils and clumsy imitators of their Greek and Italian masters, were able to solve that one vital problem of political construction on a greater scale which their masters had repeatedly attempted to solve without ever succeeding? Secondly, how was it that the Greeks and Italians went on failing to solve their problem of political consolidation after it had become fully apparent to them that the penalty of continued failure would be political and economic downfall? In the Greece of the 4th, 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, in the Italy of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries of the Christian era, everybody deplored the continuance of the old particularism, everybody tried to overcome it, and every attempt to transcend it failed until the Greeks and the Italians resigned themselves in despair to a doom which had come to seem inevitable. Why should peoples who were still resourceful and creative in other fields have remained ineffective in this one field, even under the supreme incentive of self-preservation? The first question is comparatively easy to answer. The Gentiles in the outer court of the temple succeeded in building up political organizations of a larger caliber than the Greek and Italian city-states, not because they had greater political ability or political experience than the Greeks and Italians on the contrary, they had much less but because political construction is much easier in a new country on the fringes of a civilization than in an old country at its center. It is easier because there is less pressure, more available space and no old buildings standing on the site to which an architect has to adjust his new designs. In the new country on the edge of the world, the political architect has a free field and no commitments. Even if he is a dull fellow, it is not difficult for him to build something more spacious and convenient than can be attempted by his highly trained and talented colleague, who has to work on a cramped site in the congested heart of an ancient city, overshadowed by the monuments of the past. It is the mere advantage of the geographical situation, not the merit of the local architect, which brings it about that the new big-scale architecture is invented on the outskirts and not in the center, but, though this is not the fault of the gifted inhabitants of the center, the consequences which it brings upon them are not on that account the less serious. In this attempt to answer my first question, I think I have already indicated the answer to the second to the question, that is, why the Greeks and Italians, when their city-states were dwarfed and their independence was threatened by the construction of larger-scale states around them, 
still failed to throw their city-states together and consoli. Date them into a single political structure of the new order of magnitude. The answer seems to be that they could not escape from the toils of their own great traditions. In the great age of ancient Greece the age in which she had created the Greek civilization which subsequently conquered the world an independent Athens, an end. Pendant Corinth, an independent Sparta had been the outstanding features in the political landscape. Think away the independence of those great city-states in the great age, and all that was greatest in that age, and permanently great in that civilization, would threaten to fade out of the picture. The independence of the city-states had the same roots as the civilization itself and this is another way of saying that it was ineradicable so long as that civilization lasted. Without an independent Athens and an independent Sparta there could not be a Greek world. On the other hand, the new Greek city-states founded on Asiatic soil by Alexander and his successors had no cherished tradition of independence which inhibited them from allowing themselves to be banded together, with other city-states of their kind, to form a federal organization on a larger scale. In one times when salvation depends on innovation, the parvenu finds salvation more easily than the aristocrat. I will conclude by attempting to examine how these precedents bear upon the prospects of Europe in the new age following the two world wars an age in which the dwarfing of Europe is one of the most striking new features. The Europeans of today, like the Italians of the 16th century of our era and like the Greeks of the 3rd century BC, are well aware of their peril. They fully realize how serious it is, and they understand at least, in a general way what it is that they have to accomplish in order to ward this danger off. Ever since 1914, Europeans have given much thought to the problem of European Union, and, though the publicists may have led the way, the men of action in industry, in finance, and even in diplomacy have also been at work on the problem. As the point of departure, we may take Dr. Friedrich Naumann's brilliant book Middle Europa, published in 1915. It was natural that the vision of a European political unit on a larger scale than the national state should have presented itself first in the centre of Europe, where the pressure was greatest, and in time of war, when the normal pressure of existence was so sharply intensified for the sin. Trial powers by a military struggle on two fronts and a naval blockade. It was also natural that a German writer, with the history of the German Zollverein in his mind, should start from the idea of a supranational customs union and proceed from this starting point to schemes for cooperation in other departments of public life. Between the two wars, Naumann's conception of Central Europe was expanded by other continental publicists into that of Pan Europa, a general European Union which, like Naumann's Central Europe, was to be based upon a Zolferein. This project of Pan Europa seems first to have been ventilated in interwar Austria a country for whom the subdivision of Europe into a number of independent fragments, isolated from one another economically as well as politically, was hardly tolerable within the frontiers which had been assigned to Austria in the peace settlement of 1919-20. After the Second World War, this movement for the unification of Europe has re-emerged, and it has now received powerful encouragement from America in the terms of the Marshall Plan. The eagerness and earnestness of the response which the Marshall Plan has evoked on the European side are indications that Europe does realize her danger, does know what are the proper measures of defense, and does desire to take these measures. But the crucial question is this, is Europe's desire to retain, or retrieve, some vestige of her former position in the world a force that is strong enough to overcome the obstacles in the path? The most conspicuous obstacles are perhaps the following three, first, the special problems presented by the British Commonwealth and the Soviet Union polities on the supranational scale which, hitherto, have been half inside Europe and half outside, second, the continuing tendency of the industrial system to enlarge the scale of its opera. Shins a tendency which has already burst the bounds of the national state, and may very well burst the bounds of even the largest regional units, in its march towards world unity, third, the dead weight of European tradition which makes a Europe without a sovereign independent Great Britain or a sovereign independent France as difficult for Englishmen and Frenchmen to love and cherish, or indeed even to imagine, as a Hellas without an independent Athens and Sparta would have been difficult to imagine for an Athenian and a Spartan of the 3rd or 2nd century BC. Are any or all of these obstacles likely to be overcome?
The obstacle presented by the Soviet Union looks, it must frankly be confessed, much more difficult after the Second World War than before it. Within its interwar frontiers, the Soviet Union, unlike the previous Russian Empire, lay virtually outside Europe for at that stage it did not include that fringe of countries with a Western tradition of culture whose inclusion had brought the former Russian Empire into the fellowship of European states. As a result of the War of 1914-18, the successful invasion of the Russian Empire by the Germans, and the two successive Russian revolutions of 1917, these Western borderlands parted company with Russia and entered the European fellowship on their own account as the independent national states of Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. As a result of the War of 1939-45, however, there has been a reversion here to something much more like the pre-1914 situation. The three Baltic states have been renexed to Russia as constituent republics of the Soviet Union, and not only Finland and the whole of Poland, including the former Prussian and Austrian portions, but Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary and Czechoslovakia as well, have been brought within the Soviet sphere of in fluence, de facto though not de jure, as satellite states, including the German territories, east of the northern Nice and the Oder, which have been assigned to Poland by the Soviet Union in compensation for the Ukrainian and White Russian provinces of interwar Poland which the Soviet Union has now taken back and adding to all this the Soviet zones of occupation in Germany and Austria, we find the western boundary of the Soviet world now running down the middle of Europe, north and south, from the Baltic to the Adriatic. Would the Soviet government ever allow the Soviet half of post-war Europe to combine with the other half in anything like a pan-European association? We may guess that Moscow would allow this only on one condition, and that is that Europe should form her union round a Russian nucleus and under Russian hegemony. This is a condition which the West European countries would be altogether un WLNG to accept, and that means that, if the Marshall Plan does lead to union in Europe, the union is likely to be limited to countries lying west of the western boundary of the Soviet sphere. If, however, the Russian obstacle to European Union has grown more formidable, the British obstacle has probably become easier to surmount. Any project for European Union threatens to put Great Britain in a dilemma. If a pan-European Union, or even a narrower West European Union, were successfully established by her continental European neighbours, Great Britain could hardly afford to stand outside it. Yet she could equally ill afford to enter a European Union at the cost of breaking her links with the overseas English-speaking countries the United States and the overseas members of the Commonwealth. This dilemma does not arise, however, when the European Union which Great Britain is asked to join is sponsored by the United States and is designed as a basis for closer relations between a united Europe and America. In fact, Great Britain is relieved of embarrassment by just those intentions and assumptions of the Marshall Plan that are unpalatable to the Soviet Union. The terms of the Marshall Plan allow Great Britain to have the best of both worlds, she can enter into association with her neighbours on the European continent without endangering her relations with her existing associates overseas, and a European Union on these terms can be sure of receiving Great Britain's wholehearted support. But is Union the right name for the constellation of forces that we are forecasting? Would not partition be a more accurate word? For if Eastern Europe is to be associated with the Soviet Union under Soviet hegemony and Western Europe with the United States under American leadership, the division of Europe between these two titanic non-European powers is the most significant feature of the new map to a European eye. Are we not really arriving at the conclusion that it is already beyond Europe's power to retrieve her position in the world by overcoming the disunity that has always been her bane? The dead weight of European tradition now weighs lighter than a feather in the scales, for Europe's will no longer decides Europe's destiny. Her future lies on the knees of the giants who now overshadow her. The Marshall Plan also throws into relief another of those obstacles to the Union of Europe that we have mentioned. The tendency of the industrial system to go on extending the scale of its operations till this scale becomes worldwide tells heavily against the prospects of a mere regional European grouping. If the Marshall Plan bears fruit, the result will be to salvage the countries of Western Europe by building them into an economic system, 
centering round the United States, that will embrace the whole world except for the Soviet sphere, for the West European countries will bring with them their African and Asiatic posses. Zion's independencies, while the United States will bring with her the Latin American countries and China, and the overseas members of the British Commonwealth may be counted on, in the circumstances, to join in. In terms of this scale of economic operations, a European Union, even if it embraced the whole of Europe, would be almost as inadequate an economic unit as a national state on the scale of France or a city-state on the scale of medieval Venice. On the economic plane of vision it looks as though Pan-Europa had already become an anachronism without our ever having had an opportunity of creating her, and West Europeans need not regret that Pan-Europa has been stillborn if they are offered the alternative of entering into an all but worldwide association. If Europe's once unquestioned ascendancy in the world proves to be a passing curiosity of history that is doomed to die, the Marshall Plan gives Western Europe at least the solace of seeing her dead supremacy given Christian burial. Euthanasia, however, is neither recovery nor resurrection. On the morrow of the Second World War, the dwarfing of Europe is an unmistakably accomplished fact. 7. The International Outlook 1 When I compare the aftermaths of the two wars, I see a number of obvious resemblances, but one outstanding